Our next speaker is an electroengineer and will be um, actually has plenty of experience in the work of Tesla. He's vice president and editor of the Borderland Research Foundation. He has had in the past RCA support, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric support, as well as Bell Telephone support. He's also had the uh, distinguishing characteristic of a reversing the utilities power meter without the company approval and uh, <laughs> received some reaction for that. Speaking on the topic of representations of electric induction, we have Mr. Eric Tallard. Okay, there has been a slight change. Uh, representations of electric induction would have been so theoretical and nothing but blackboards full of Greek letters, which I didn't feel was really appropriate. I've changed it to the principles of wireless power, which I think will be easier for people to understand. Okay, in the period from 1890 to 1900, Dr. Nikola Tesla was engaged in the systematic research of high-frequency electric waves with the specific aim of developing a method of transmission and reception of electrical energy without the use of wires. Inspired by Dr. Heinrich Hertz's experimental researches into the Maxwell theory of electromagnetic waves, Dr. Tesla developed various apparatus for the object of exploring the developments of Dr. Hertz. Tesla found to his dismay he couldn't prove that the oscillations that Hertz was using were akin to the original theory of electromagnetism as described by Maxwell and which Hertz attempted to prove. What Tesla discovered was the oscillations from his transformers were longitudinal electric waveforms or what might be called electric rays of induction. This indicates why Tesla was extensively interested in research with X-rays, which were considered in that period of time to be a longitudinal form of radiation. The theory of electric waves wasn't of much concern to Marconi, however, and he developed a practical system which was put into commercial use by 1919, constructed five high-frequency power plants around the world, which operated on 18 kilocycles per second at 200 kilowatts of drive to the antenna. This was done by motor generator sets known as the Alexanderson alternators and was fed to a multiple loaded antenna system, which I have shown in the figure here. Okay, what Marconi had is he had a giant mesh of copper suspended 300 feet in the air. It was roughly 1,000 feet long by 500 feet wide. He had a similar mesh of wires buried in the ground underneath the antenna to form a giant capacitor plate. And then at the particular installation I was associated with, there was a large bronze plate buried in the Pacific Ocean right next to where the San Andreas Fault comes in. This is in Bolinas, California. Okay, you had a 200 kilowatt alternator here. The motor generator set had an efficiency of about 20%, so it drew about a megawatt off the utility company's power line. It was fed with a 66,000 volt, 60 cycle power line. Okay, through his resonant transformer, he developed about 100 kilovolts across this large capacitor plate. And in order to prevent the formation of ridiculous quantities of current that would just fuse the wires, he had to put these loading coils in here to tune with the capacitance to neutralize these currents out. It's what electrical engineering referred to as power factor correction. Well, in this case, it's the opposite of what you normally encounter. Now we're not using coils, we're using capacitors. Okay, in the schematic representation, we have two waves that propagate off of this. We have a magnetic wave that propagates through the Earth, and we have a dielectric wave that propagates through the atmosphere. And then the electric wave, which is the combination of the dielectric and magnetic, is the actual transmission wave on the so-called antenna structure. Now you find that the wave propagations of these waves are quite unlike electromagnetic waves because they're, in essence they're not even electric waves. You have a dielectric wave and a magnetic wave and these basically phase and form a kind of nodal system around the planet where you'll end up with appearances of electrical energy that can be captured by a similar antenna. Okay, upon completion of these wireless plants, the United States government formed Radio Corporation of America to take control of these installations. This was in 1919. As soon as Marconi finished them, he lost them. The RCA was very quick to develop upon the transverse form of electromagnetic wave propagation, and they developed what was referred to as the Type D director, which now is known amongst most radio engineers as the rhombic antenna. It's basically you have utility poles, usually between 100 and or stacked utility poles from 150 to 200 feet in height, holding a large diamond-shaped coil of wire in the air. You have a resistance at the end and a high-frequency transmitter in the input, and waves are launched on this transmission structure, and in their propagation to the resistor are lost by energy leakages, which are called electromagnetic radiation. Okay, we have the inductance of the antenna here. The antenna 
area represented by you know conventional coils and the capacitance in this area between the surfaces of the conductors is represented by capacitance. Now our actual transmission is done by the conductance that appears due to the dielectric hysteresis of this capacitance in this wide open space. Here we have a resistance that appears in the magnetic hysteresis in the inductance, magnetic inductance of this wide open space. So the energy basically disappears into the hysteresis of the ether and very little is reflected back and it's a highly inefficient system of transmission but of course it's what we use today. The dipole antenna basically is just a shortened version of this that has to be tuned for a particular resonant frequency but this will operate on all frequencies. Okay, the development of, of this antenna and the use of these Hertzian waves diverted much interest from Nikola Tesla's work and delayed the um, here. Delayed the Tesla world system from coming into being because this was much simpler and practical, both the Marconi and RCA systems, rather than having large high voltage towers and electrostatic generators. To quote uh, Tesla's thoughts on the development of wireless in this point in history, quote, the commercial application of the art has led to the construction of larger transmitters and multiplication of their number. Greater distances had to be covered and it became imperative to employ receiving devices of ever greater sensitiveness. All these changes have cooperated in emphasizing the trouble and seriously impairing the reliability and value of these plants. To such a degree has this been the case that conservative businessmen and financiers have come to look upon this method of conveying intelligence as one of offering but very limited possibilities and the government has deemed it necessary to assume control. This unfortunate state of affairs, fatal to the enlistment of capital and healthful competitive development, could have been avoided had electricians not remained to this day under a delusive theory, speaking of the Hertzian theory, and had practical exploiters of this advance not permitted enterprise to outrun technical competence. Okay, Dr. Tesla himself remained totally unswayed by these developments and fully understood that the Hertzian waves were useless because of their scattering nature. And to quote again, nothing illustrates this better than the recent demonstrations of a number of experts with very short waves, which have created the impression that power will eventually be transmitted by such means. In reality, experiments of this kind are the very denial of the possibility of energy transmission. And this, of course, brings to mind the recent proposal to send so photovoltaic generated power via mi microwave beams and satellites down to the Earth. Okay, the Tesla system of transmission and reception of electric energy without the employment of connecting wires or waveguides as conceived by Dr. Tesla is not the propagation of any type of electromagnetic wave. The word electromagnetism has no relation to any of Tesla's work, nor is it the excitation of the Earth ionosphere waveguide as is often proposed. The Tesla system employs resonant actions along lines or rays of electric induction, these lines standing between the transmitter and the receiver. So you have your Tesla magnifying transmitter here, or more appropriately, your Tesla transponder, and your Tesla trans receiving Tesla transponder here. So the generator is directly connected to the load via these lines of induction. Okay, the apparatus for establishing these lines of inductions, of course, has taken on the name Tesla magnifying transmitter. By definition, the TMT is a system of resonant transformers harmonically balanced to the electric condition of the Earth. Also, the monopolar nature of the TMT greatly facilitates the departure of energy from the apparatus and into the environment. When you experiment with a resonating coil, you find that all your magnetism appears at one end and all your dielectricity appears at the other end. And you have, it's interesting, even electrical discharges which occur off of the end of this will curve back and come to the point where they started from. And you can hook a, uh, a radio frequency watt meter or amp meter or whatever you want here and there'll be actual indication of very heavy flows of energy, all of which are reflected back to the coil, except that utilized by the load. Okay, to, to, these lines of induction established by the TMT are drawn into the high inductivity of the Earth's interior, which can be viewed as a very, you know, high capacity capacitor, especially considering the theory that the Earth is basically hot glass inside the mantle. Okay, to illustrate exactly how Tesla felt this propagation would occur in the Earth. He has an experiment that he gives here. 
Okay, to quote, I here have a short, wide tube which is exhausted to a high degree, which back then was just about, you know, the exhaustion you would find in a regular street lamp. In other words, there's still gas in the bulb. Okay, and covered with a substantial coating of bronze. He plated bronze onto the surface of the bulb to give it a metal shell around the outside to allegedly shield it. The coating barely allowing the light to shine through. A metallic clasp with a hook for suspending this tube is fastened around the middle portion of the ladder the clasp being in contact with the bronze coating. I now want to light the gas inside by suspending the tube on a connecting wire to a coil. Anyone who would try this experiment for the first time, not having any previous experience, would probably take care to be quite alone when making this trial for fear that he might not become the joke of his assistants. Still, the bulb lights in spite of the metal coating, and the light can be distinctly perceived through the ladder. Okay, and he has another experiment, a long tube covered with a long tube covered with aluminum bronze lights when held in one hand and the other hand touching the terminal of the coil quite powerfully. It might be objected that the coatings are not sufficiently conducting. Still, even if they were highly resistant, they ought to screen the gas. They certainly screen it perfectly in a condition of rest, but not by far perfectly when charge is surging within the coating. But the loss of energy which occurred <coughs> excuse me which occurs in the tube, notwithstanding the screen, is occasioned principally by the presence of the gas. End of quote. Okay, the, the dielectric induction through the interior of the earth communicates the energy from the transmitter to the receiver, as shown in figure four. Oh, sorry, I don't, that's one that's too hard to draw. Okay. Let me think briefly how I'm going to do this here. Okay, basically it's just, I'll use figure three. What's that? Okay, I can describe figure four as what we have here. Okay, here's the this, this schematic drawing of the Tesla transformer with its elevated capacitance and propagating into the earth. Tesla uses the analogy here having a large balloon with a hand pump putting pressure waves in and out of the balloon and little pressure gauges all around the planet indicating receiving instruments. And of course, the pointers on the pressure gauges all dance up and down in perfect correspondence with the hand pump. And then, of course, we have here the Wardenclyffe Tower attached to the Earth doing the same thing electrically, pumping dielectric energy in and out of the Earth, which is captured by small receiving apparatus that take this dielectric induction and convert it back into electrical induction. Yes, there's a question. Yes, this, all, these books are all available from BSRF. Okay, so what we have here in the operating principles is the Tesla magnifying transmitter, being that it propagates energy through the ground, gives rise to the question is how do we ground the apparatus? Okay, since the so-called ground is now the hot terminal, in other words, the, the, the so-called ground of the Tesla coil is where the action is really going on. This the capacitance is not where you take your output from, in other words, the ball on the top. So being that the hot terminal also has to be the ground, it's not capable of serving as electrical reference point. Okay, now here's the most important feature of the Tesla magnifying transmitter. Okay, through the distributed mutual inductance in the coil and the odd function resonance, which basically boils down to the quarter wave resonance, you have a principle known as the virtual ground. So what the coil does is it establishes a, a ground reference system. Let's go to this schematic here. Your Tesla coil and its associated spherical capacitance act to bring a ground on this point of the transformer, leaving the Earth connection hot. So the thing is capable of transmitting, and then you feed it through a regular radio frequency transformer, either resonant or not, and that delivers or abstracts energy from the system. Okay, now Tesla developed another device, which is the mechanical analog of this, and it's called the Telegeodynamic Oscillator. Now this is an interesting device as it applies this principle with a small reciprocating air engine and a system of coils and capacitors with generator type coupling to a linear generator to this mechanical system. And you find that this thing can shake stuff around without having anything to stand up against. It needs no wall or backing or anything in which to hold back to push against. So again, you have the virtual ground principle here. And this kind of breaks down the, the notions that were established by the Newtonian 
ideas of action and reaction and opens up a whole new world for exploration. Okay, this reconfiguration of energy that goes on in here basically is the result of the separation of cause and effect in time or space and what's what might be called hysteresis. So the TMT as well as the TGO, Tesla Geodynamic Oscillator, is capable of transmitting vibrations by virtue of the fact that it is self-referencing and doesn't require any electrical or mechanical reference from which to push against. This relates somewhat to the saying, give me a fulcrum and I'll move the earth. But Tesla found this type of fulcrum and not only did he move the earth and vibrate, you know, buildings near the point of breaking in New York, but he brought the entire electrical system of the earth into vibration, producing a standing lightning discharge in Colorado Springs and at that time, who knows where else at resonant nodes on the planet. Okay, the Tesla transponder, or TMT, can be divided into five distinct categories or components. We have the earth, which serves as one part of the component, and then we have the reflecting capacitance, which serves as the complementary part. Okay, we have the energy transformer, where energy is either supplied or abstracted by a rotating apparatus or by, you know, a resistance or negative resistance or thyrotrons or spark gaps or any one of the infinitude of methods. And then we have a source of magnetizing power, which is called, usually called a capacitor or a dielectric inductor. Then we have the coupling transformer, what this does is couple, couple this electric energy into the, the transmission system established here, keeping a certain isolation between our power system or energy system and the oscillating system so it doesn't burn this out. Okay, and then we have finally the resonant coil, which does the real magic work here. This establishes the virtual ground, or what you might say dematerializes the electrical energy. In this arrangement, energy is continuously bounced back and forth between the Earth and the reflecting capacitance at point two there. Okay, some of this energy is refracted into the Earth and exists in the, sat in the Earth as another or coupled standing electric wave. Okay, this standing wave of energy pulsation in the system in the Earth is maintained by the energy transformer and kept into continuous oscillation. So there's a pair of standing waves produced. There's a standing wave inside the TMT, and then there's a standing wave in the Earth. Also, we have another standing wave which exists in time, which is called the LC oscillation of the system, and that's the energy exchange between the energy transformer and the coupling transformer, this being magnetic and dissipative, and this being dielectric and generative of electrical energy. Okay, now the appearance that this is the output terminal, the coil, is given by the fact being that you're standing on the Earth at that point then everything around you is charged to the same potential, so to speak, or in the same electrical condition. So this appears to be neutral and this appears to be hot. But from the standpoint of the Earth, this is the neutral and this is the hot. So it's kind of a, um, a reverse situation we have here. It's not normally encountered in electrical work. Okay, the electrical conditions surrounding the TMT no longer can be represented by conventional or electromagnetic concepts because energy has been converted from these dimensions of material energy, which is given as mass times velocity squared, which breaks into mass multiplied by length squared divided by time squared into a new type of energy, the dimensions being given by Wilhelm Reich as length cubed divided by time squared, where mass becomes functionally equivalent to length. And this, of course, is a natural consequence of, of working with what's called skin effect in electrical conductors, where the mass of the conductor drops out of the picture and really only the circumference of the conductor plays a part in the electrical phenomena. And that's what we're dealing with here with the Tesla transformers, extremely high frequency or high rates of electrical movement that completely circumvent the actions in the conductor. This dematerialized energy is the spatial analog of reactive power that's encountered in alternating current electrical systems. Okay, now what's of particular interest is that dielectric saturation that occurs around this area here produces organic type of waveforms that are all based on the patterns of life, such as the golden ratio and the fact that they can exist for a period of time after the source of power is removed and many things that living objects usually only are capable of doing. Okay, and this eventually gets in, takes us to the theory of cosmic superimposition by Wilhelm Reich, and I've encountered this in practice by having two Tesla coils beam into a light bulb and having actual formations such as galaxies and nebula that you normally only see in deep space occur inside the light bulb in living color. Okay, the pulsations between the energy transformer, which is dielectric in nature, and the coupling transformer, oh, I already covered that, okay. 
So it can be seen that the TMT involves three distinct standing electric waves. There's the electric wave in the Earth, which we will call space dimensional. There's the electric wave of the LC oscillation, which we will call time dimensional. But in here, in the virtual grounding system, we have a new electrical wave, which we have to call extra dimensional. And Tesla referred to this as extra coil. Okay, this has a direct analogy in music, where harmony is space dimensional and rhythm is time dimensional and melody is extra dimensional. So you can basically use music as an analog for this type of situation. And it's of particular interest to note that the uh, music developed by J.S. Bach, I have found to serve as one of the most fundamental expressions of electricity, even beyond Steinmetz or any of the more modern researchers that attempt to use conventional mathematics and words. And I intuited most of what I know about Tesla from the music of Bach. So we have what here is called a triple energy transient, which is an extremely difficult thing to analyze because we have three standing waves, each containing a pair of energy. So we have basically, more correctly, six forms of energy to bring into now not just regular resonance, but what's called consonant resonance. And this is the one thing that I found everybody misses in building Tesla apparatus is bringing the device to this consonant resonance. And the main reason we have trouble with bringing these devices into these type of resonance is our science of algebra cannot deal with equations greater than the second degree. There's no symbolic expression for handling these kind of things, so we basically have no language for doing it. Okay, secondly here, what I'd like to cover basically is, is some of the history and elemental theory of induction in the dimension of time. Okay, if we go back, we find that the elemental principles of electrical induction were first discovered by Michael Faraday in the very early part of the 19th century. Faraday consi considered action at a distance through empty space highly improbable and developed his theory of contiguous particles in the ether and particles in the ether and polarizations of these particles and developing what are called lines of force. Okay, Faraday found that these lines of force were curved and didn't follow the shortest path between point A and B and he was considered to be a madman for proposing that at this time where action at a distance was the prevalent theory. Okay, in the course of his experimental researches, Faraday found that if you take magnetic flux and change the quantity of it with respect to time, it produced what's called an electromotive force, which we now give the name volts to. Okay, this has become known as the elect law of electromagnetic induction. So basically in English, the EMF of magnitude E is directly proportional to the total number of lines induction enclosing a conducting system and inversely proportional to the length of time required to produce or consume these lines of induction. This discovery marks the beginning of our knowledge of transformer theory. The also Faraday discovered, or didn't discover, but basically developed the lines of force situation for what are called electrostatic charges and coined the word dielectric lines of induction, which is, serves as a complementary field to the magnetic lines of induction. Okay, the experimental researches of Faraday greatly impressed two very influential electrical scientists of the 19th century, namely James Clerk Maxwell and James J. Thompson. Okay, Maxwell sought to translate Faraday's experimental researches into a more mathematical form to facilitate understanding and working with these. In the process, Maxwell discovered the complementary law of dielectric induction, which states your lines of dielectric force, compared to the time it takes to produce or consume them, develops what's called the displacement current, which we normally give the name amperes to. Now, this displacement current is interesting as it doesn't flow through wires, it flows through empty space. And this is the key for dealing with Tesla's work, is the displacement current. The, the, the key and the most fundamental problem that we have in dealing with Tesla's work is we've ignored the dielectric field, we've ignored the displacement current that flows through space and substituted electrons and particles and other things which are supposed to flow through the wire, which is absolutely impossible because the wire is solid. And it's just completely uh, left our understanding of Tesla out of the picture. <laughs> Okay, the complementary nature of magnetic and dielectric inductions led Maxwell to discover the existence of a constant numerical proportion between the units of measure in magnetism and the units of measure in dielectricity, this constant being numerically equal to 1 over the velocity of light squared. 
This famous discovery led Maxwell to the theory of electromagnetism. This theory stating that electric waves are identical to light waves and thereby gave the notion that magnetism and dielectricity are inseparable. The Maxwell theory of electromagnetism dominated research into electric waves, particularly after the experiments of Heinrich Hertz. Nikola Tesla comments on this matter. I do not hesitate to say that in a short time it will be recognized as one of the most remarkable and inexplicable aberrations of the scientific mind which has ever been recorded in history. <laughs> okay, Professor Thompson took a much le less mathematical approach and a more physical approach to Faraday's discoveries. Thompson considered Faraday's contiguous particles and lines of induction as concrete physical realities. Despite the shift in contemporary thought circa 1900, back to what resembles action at a distance through an etherless space, and now, unfortunately, also a spiritless and dead space. Thompson considered propagation of magnetic inductions as distinctly independent of the propagation of dielectric induction, rather than these two inductions propagating co-jointly as given by Maxwell. He conceived of these propagations of inductions as being Faraday's lines of force and the magnetic lines of induction as propagating transverse to the flow of propagation of energy. Now, these lines or tubes of induction drag on the ether and are retarded in their motion and therefore are limited to being less than the velocity of light in their propagation velocity. Okay, the dielectric lines radiate radially between conducting surfaces and the energy flows in the same direction. So what you have is lines going through the ether in a needle-like fashion and you don't have any drag at all. A, a pair of analogies would be a parachute is a good representation of magnetic induction through the ether. It definitely has a, a finite, limited velocity, whereas the propagation of dielectric induction is more like a rocket or a missile, which of course can sail right through and the aerodynamics of it completely um, eliminate, for all practical purposes, the opposition to its movement through the media. Okay, now what happens here is the dielectric induction, just a minute, being that it can go faster, propagates ahead of the magnetic induction. So you end up with a situation of an interference pattern along the lines of magnetic and dielectric induction, producing what appears to be an electromagnetic wave. This concept is very important for understanding the works of Nikola Tesla, the separated induction. Do you have a question? Okay, but there's a lot of stuff to cover here, and I have a very finite quantity of time. Okay, in his research for the contiguous particles of the ether, Professor Thompson discovered what is known as the electron. Much misunderstanding developed with regard to the relation between this particle and dielectric induction. This has worked much harm into the proper understanding of Tesla's discoveries and the understanding of electricity in general. To quote C.P. Steinmetz on this matter, unfortunately, to a large extent, in dealing with the dielectric field, the prehistoric conception of the electrostatic charge on the conductor still exists, and by its use destroys the analogy between the two components of the electric field, the magnetic and dielectric, and makes the consideration of the dielectric fields unnecessarily complicated. There's obviously no more sense of thinking of the displacement current as current which charges the conductor with a quantity of electricity than there is in speaking of the electromotive force of magnetic induction as charging the conductor with a quantity of magnetism. But while the latter conception, together with the notion of a quantity of magnetism, etc., has vanished in Faraday's representation of the magnetic field by lines of magnetic force, the terminology of electrostatic charges in many textbooks still speaks of electric charges on the conductor and the energy stored by them without considering that the dielectric energy is not on the surface of the conductor but in the space outside the conductor just as with the magnetic energy. In 1854, Sir William Thompson, or who's what was known as Lord Kelvin, published the theory of electric oscillations. This theory demonstrated the interaction of the law of electromagnetic induction with the law of dielectric induction, forming the law of electric induction, which virtually is unknown. And that is, is your electric induction, which is the product of magnetic and dielectric induction, against the, ra the ratio, or against the time squared, in this case, of the production or consumption of this electric induction gives you the quantity, what's called the activity of the electrical system, or what we're in the habit of calling power, which is usually given the units of watts. And you can see what it is. It's the product of electromagnetic induction and dielectric induction. And contrary to popular belief, the watt second is not the fundamental unit of electricity. It is this that's the fundamental unit of electricity which is 
lines of dielectric induction multiplied by the lines of dielectric induction equals the units of electric induction. And this has the dimensions in energy terms of energy multiplied by time, of course, which we usually refer to as Planck's constant. So in this case, Planck's constant gives us the size of a magnetic line of induction and a dielectric line of induction at their crossing point. Now, of course, if they don't cross, then you don't have electromagnetism. You have Tesla energy, which is distinctly different. We talked about it a little earlier. Okay, and this theory and the further development by Hemholtz, Heaviside, and Steinmetz represents the fundamental theory behind nearly all of Tesla's apparatus. Lord Kelvin felt that it was possible to establish compressional waves such as sound waves through the, what he called the luminiferous ether, these waves being a version of Maxwell's displacement current. By the way, another researcher in this field refers to this ether as the chemical ether. This current, often called capacitor current, flows through the electric insulators. 